So tonight, Linda Butler, who's author of From Garden to Vase, Growing and Using Your Own Cut Flowers, is one of the books that she authored and published through Timber Press. She's also written two other horticultural books, both about clematis. And in addition to teaching as an instructor at Clackamas Community College, she uh, for the last many years has been the curator of Rogerson Clematis Collection, which I know she's going to mention during her presentation. So with no further ado, Linda. Thank you, Sherry. And the Clackamas County Master Gardeners are always very welcome. Um, I'm uh, happy to speak for our sort of uh, hometown master gardener chapter at the Rogerson Clematis Garden. Um, so yes, in 2007, Timber Press uh, published Garden to Vase, Growing and Using Your Own Cut Flowers with me as author and Alan Mandel doing the absolutely swoon worthy pictures uh, for that. I think I had four total pictures in the whole book. Um, but a, and part of that book is a directory of cut flowers, cut foliage, things you would grow for the berries or the fruit, ornamental grasses. And a lot has happened since 2007. Uh, and the book is not even in print anymore. You can still, uh, you know, it wanders across your screen at uh, Powell's. But um, Sherry wanted to talk about cutting gardens and cut flowers and the year round concept uh, from the very beginning of when she approached me to do this talk. And I decided right off the bat that I would send you guys um, the handout and it's two pages. And one of them is tips about harvesting and conditioning and how you handle cut flowers uh, at, and at the time that you harvest them. And then also um, on that same, page on the river side is about um, the various kinds of preservatives that you can make at home or something just as simple as knowing how much rubbing alcohol to add uh, to water to get things that you might think of as not being very long lasting uh, to get them to last better. So in keeping with our 12 month theme, I'm gonna start out in the winter which we're just coming out of. So this is a mask that was, uh, masks required. Um, this is a wreath that was done with all living plant material that will dry in place. And because it's outside, that sort of uh, uh, has preserved it. And I understand from Lucy Hardiman that she still has this on her front porch and uh, her porch does face west, so eventually those hydrangeas are going to fade. But uh, all of that plant material was used fresh. And so there's camellia leaves, uh, viburnum, tinus, Bewley's variegated is the main variegated foliage you say, see there. There's also some euonymus. That particular hydrangea is hydrangea aisha, which is one of the few mop heads that has a cupped, um, the bracts are cupped. Uh, there's even some plain old yew. The dark foliage is a pittosporum. And then just a little bit of found ribbon. I never throw ribbon away. I have a box under the bed that's full of, you know, long and short uh, pieces of ribbon um, to add. So these are all, all of that plant materials from my garden. I didn't buy anything to do that. And, um, and I did a very similar wreath but using a different hydrangea for myself. So winter is really the time when we celebrate our broadleaf evergreens. We have a lot of them that do well here in the Pacific Northwest. And some of them are even native over in the coast range. The Garia elliptica um, is really um, a terrific, terrifically ornamental through the winter. 
Uh, the common name is tassel flower and the tassel flower buds that you see here are going to elongate, get much longer, but by the time they're eight to 10 inches long, they're poofing out their pollen everywhere and they're not pleasant to have inside. But before the catkins completely elongate, you can use them in this stage. And so here they are in Lucy Herodeman's bathroom for her annual Christmas party, which of course has not been held for two years. But um, uh, anyway, you can see the garia there sort of forming the focal point and it just gives this tremendous texture, very interesting and also really long lasting. Uh, I love forcing branches and it's really fun to bring things in two or three weeks even before they're going to be in bloom inside uh, outside and get them to bloom inside and it couldn't be easier. Uh, all you want to do is split the stems um, vertically so you make a nice angled cut and then a clean vertical cut up the stem to expose as much cambium as you can without putting a lot of debris in the water. Um, and then warm water initially, and usually in about two weeks, you might change the water once a week. In a nice big container, you can have a big wallop of uh, blooms, Coralopsis, Passiflora's, very easy to force. And so are the star magnolias. Once you see the buds start to expand on your plants outside in late January, you can go out and start picking twigs or larger branches. Um, I don't remember, I've had Magnolia stellata king rose in my garden for so long that I really don't remember where I got it. Uh, Cause it was, I knew I wanted a star Magnolia. It was one of the first plants I put in my garden 30 years ago or almost 30 years ago. And uh, so I don't, I don't quite remember uh, where I got it, but it's absolutely gorgeous. It does turn completely white, but the buds are very, very pink. And then uh, it softens, but a great plant for forcing. And the tallest element you see in this derangement here is Lanicera fragrantissima, which if you're not growing it, um, it's true, it's not native, but it is not an aggressive plant and it establishes quickly. It's not a vining honeysuckle, it's a shrub. It starts flowering in November and the hummingbirds love it. I swear the flowers must have antifreeze in them. Uh, when we had our big you know, ice and snow mess in February, the hummingbirds were pecking at the ice, knocking the ice off of it, and still getting nectar out of those flowers. Absolutely amazing. And it is an excellent cut flower. And what's really great about it for winter is that it's flowering without the leaves. So you really get the full impact of all of those white flowers that line the, um, the stems. And I wanna mention uh, the dark flowered, uh, or the dark leafed plant here is a Laura Petalum. Uh, when I got mine in 1996, I was told it might not be hardy and it's now about 12 feet tall and I'm limbing it up uh, to be a um, multi-trunked small tree, um, but great year round purpley green foliage. There is also some Clematis in here, and this is Clematis fasciculiflora. Um, we originally acquired it for the Clematis garden, and I acquired my plant for home from Cystus Nursery. But it is an evergreen Clematis for shade. It's hardy down to about zone six, which is pretty unusual for evergreens. Uh, but they can grow this in Spokane, in the colder parts of Spokane, and I've seen it done. So those are great uh, winter things. The Clematis fasciculiflora is a vine, gets pretty large, uh, but it really does want partial shade. It's going to sunburn horribly if it gets hot afternoon sun and it flowers in February, March and the hummingbirds love it. So it lots of, lots of home runs there, lots of uh, points scored by Clematis fasciculiflora. 
And I'm always on the lookout for conifers that have a distinctive texture and even some color uh, that aren't strictly firs and spruce. And um, it, when I was in the floral business, we always said that once you got past Christmas, you couldn't sell an arrangement that had evergreens in it that looked like typical evergreens because people would say, oh, you're giving me stuff that's left over from Christmas. And, and it, there's so many great conifers out there and I don't have to tell you guys, but this is one of my favorites. This is uh, the Golden Mops, uh, Camisiparis, really unusual and in full sun and in the winter, it seems like it's much more vivid uh, than it is even through the summer when it's still bright yellow, but a great texture. I'm not going to belabor uh, hellebore too much, but my students at Clackamas Community College uh, for two different years when I was teaching the commercial floral design, floral design classes, they always offered them winter term. And it was a great time for us to do experiments with hellebores and preservative. In several of the more learned books about hellebores, they talk about them as cut flowers, but it's a a glancing blow, they really don't go into details. And so they would say, use alcohol. Well, okay, do I wanna wipe the stems down with alcohol? Do I wanna be drinking the alcohol? How much, you know, when do you give it to the plant? So on. So we were able to do two different winter terms in a row um, between 15 and 18 specimens throughout the term that we would follow. And what we found consistently is that two tablespoons of alcohol could be rubbing alcohol, uh, isopropyl could be methyl, could be ethyl alcohol. In, um, and we were using it from Walgreens. So we were using either 70% or 90% concentrations, um, but two tablespoons in a quart of water. And it was the difference between these guys lasting four or five days and lasting 17 days. I think the one that we had that lasted the longest was actually 20 days and we had used the alcohol plus a packet of uh, floral preservative that had come from the florist. So that would be about a tablespoon is in those little packets that you get. So I wanted to talk here just for a minute about what I've learned uh, about uh, clematis breeding. And there used to be a wonderful clematis, uh, or not clematis, hellebores uh, breeder. Um, it was Honey Hill Farms, Jim and Audrey Metcalf. And they were really good friends of Marietta and Ernie O'Byrne who are doing the Winter Jewels series. But um, Audrey really articulated beautifully the, the DNA progression that goes on as a single hellebore with the nectaries there. Um, you'll find in the wild, they'll sort of sport or cross pollinate and you end up with an anemone flowered type um, hellebore. And once you start crossing these with each other, then you get the double hellebores where the nectaries stop trying to be nectaries at all and really start to become more like more sepals. And uh, this particular one is Jade Tiger, uh, really, really long lasting uh, as a cut flower. And um, so there's a description of that preservative um, in, the, um, in your handout. But hellebores as winter cut flowers, pretty great. And I used to do the BFAs, big, fabulous arrangements that uh, drew attention to the winter botanicals display that the Hardy Plant Society of Oregon would have at the Yard Garden and Patio Show. And this was the display that I did the second to the last year um, that the show happened. And I want to particularly focus in on using Edgeworthia as a cut flowering branch because it's just really, really tremendous. But when you take um, branches off for cutting, remember that this is in the Daphne family. 
So if you just do a heading back cut where you leave kind of a stump, you're going to have all of these latent buds that are packed around the end, the cut end, um, they're just going to explode and you're going to end up with very heavy, very weak, brittle growth that has all this new growth at the end of it. So it's really important when you're harvesting or when you're pruning your Edgeworthia in the garden to make sure that you cut it all the way back to the crotch to, and of course, Daphne's, that family of plants, they tend to branch in threes. So make sure you cut back cut it all the way back to uh, the original branch that it's coming out of or where you've got a trio coming out. Um, but Akebono is also known around sometimes as red dragon, but it is the same uh, plant, the orangey red version of the yellow uh, Edgeworthia that's been in the trade for a really long time. And here it is just as a nice, simple filler with the forest Coralopsis branches and some store-bought um, tulips. Um, I started um, pushing the season again. I just, I love tulips. They're one of my favorite cut flowers. And so I try to, as long as they're cheap and local, I try to get them as often as I can. There's nothing wrong with flowers for cutting that are of short stature. Uh, with those, you can make little nosegays and posies and sort of tuck flowers around your house in ways that you uh, might not have thought of it before. When I was first getting into floristry, I found this book called Small and Beautiful. And it was all about flower arrangements. None of the arrangements in the book were taller than eight inches. And I was utterly, utterly charmed. People think of me as the Hardy Plant Society florist, and I'm doing these huge, you know, arrangements that are taller than me. And, and yet in my house, it's full of little tiny this and that all over the place. And the Primulus Vera, Primula Vera Sunset set Shades, that's the cowslip, typically yellow but somebody saw populations um, where there were other colors and they started crossing those. So they created this seed strain of really vibrant oranges and reds. And then Pulmonaria Benediction is, um, in my garden, it's been in bloom maybe three weeks or so. It's just been, uh, it's a tremendous, tremendous Pulmonaria. Not the flashiest foliage, but I'm growing it for those true blue flowers. I love muscari. I love grape hyacinths. I had, I have since I was a little child. We had this funny, uh, the house I grew up in had a very funny little long narrow planting bed on the west side of the house that got super, super hot and it faced the next house over. And my mother just paved it with good old fashioned grape hyacinths. So I, you know, there something that's sort of one of those childhood things. Um, but at the Clematis Garden, we've been growing um, the Muscari latifolium that has those broad tulipy, tulipy looking leaves, uh, very dark flowers, and then the sterile lighter flowers on the top. I never planted Muscari neglectum in my garden in Selwood, but there it is and there it has been. And um, it's a little bit lighter blue. And again, it's got little sterile flowers at the top. It's got that little edging of a sort of white petticoat at the edge of every little grape in the grape hyacinth. And of course they have a nice uh, light smell to them and just great in your little small intimate flower arrangements. And for larger arrangements, you can grow the summer snowflakes. And summer, of course, estivum is a relative term. There is a Leucogem vernus who only gets about half this tall. Uh, we're looking at a plant that's about 18 inches tall. The Leucogems have foliage like a daffodil. Um, it's a little bit broader, but they're wonderful interplanted with daffodils. They just uh, seem to really mingle. I don't know that they're poisonous like the Narcissus are, but um, we haven't had deer that get into the Columbus garden bother these at all while they're in bloom. 
And each one of those little bells has six overlapping petals and each one has a green dot on the bottom. And each stem will have four to six of these flowers that drop out one by one and each one of those will last about a week. So you've got this overlap and the whole a period of bloom for a whole clump of these. And they grow from a, a bulb that you would be hard pressed to tell from some of the smaller uh, daffodil narcissus bulbs. Uh, but these are a absolutely wonderful cut flower, um, very long lasting. I think the impression of them in the cut flower trade is that they would be hard to ship. They seem very fragile. So the bulbs are not expensive and you should grow these for yourself. I do have some favorites uh, in the Narcissus clan. I love the pheasant's eye or poet's Narcissus. Um, that's sort of my favorite group with that little brightly edged cup. I'm also very fond of good old Mrs. R.O. Backhouse who was allegedly the first of the pink trumpeted uh, tula, uh, daffodils. But I don't really think that's very pink, but I don't tell the daffodil people that because I don't like it when people tell me that clematis aren't really blue. I mean, I know that, but I don't need to be told that. So, um, so I don't say that this looks more apricot than pink to the daffodil people, but I do really love it, Mrs. R.O. Backhouse. Um, something I wanna mention about the Narcissus is they do have that clear toxic sap. And I think, uh, I hope it mentions in your, uh, in the handout that the best thing to do with these is actually to rinse them, to sort of let them bleed out. So go pick all the daffodils you want, put them in a bucket of clean water and let them sit for 10 to 20 minutes and then pick them up and see if that thick mucus-like clear um, sap is still running out of them. If it is, put them in a new bucket of clean water and let them sit for another 20 minutes or so. And usually it takes two rinsings and then all the sap that's going to come out has come out. And then you can go ahead and put them in clean water again. And at, the, in that point, at that point, they're not gonna be toxic to themselves. They're not gonna be toxic to anything else. But we don't think of much about the vascular system in plants. The xylem goes up and the phloem goes down, but those two systems are closed to each other. And so Narcissus are not sucking up their own sap as they're attached to the ground, to the bulb, the living plant in the ground. And so their own sap that's flowing down is actually toxic to them. And, and so that's why narcissists don't last very long. Um, if you just put them in um, you know, water and then you further insult them because you've read somewhere that they don't need very much water. And I see that uh, mistakenly said about tulips also, but you have to think of flower stems like a straw and you don't want anything to clog the straw. And it's easier for us to drink the Burgerville milkshake if it's when it's full um, and there isn't any berry material clogging up the straw and the cut flowers don't have the advantage of being able to take the straw out and blow out the whatever's clogging it. Um, they're just stuck when something's clogging them. So, uh, and they're stuck when they're drinking something they shouldn't be drinking like their own toxic sap. So, with these guys, the answer is rinsing. Um, it takes a few minutes, might be an hour that you're coming back every so often and, and putting them into a clean vase or a clean bucket of water. But eventually you have narcissus that will last 10 days instead of lasting two to four days. So this is the reason that the handout for this talk wasn't ready until today. Um, about three years, I have loved this plant in my garden, the spring vetchling, and I started experimenting with it as a cut flower about three years ago. It only gets at its highest, maybe 18 inches tall, but it's got nice branching so you can have shorter flowers. I usually cut each branch in half so that I've got a stem um, that's about the right height and that's the tip 
and then um, an another branch that comes off that's lower. But this beautiful, vibrant uh, violet color and uh, just had to uh, include it in the talk when I walked outside Sunday morning and was going to send the list off to Sherry and went, no, I have to redo the whole thing now because I've got to remember everything because I have to show this wonderful plant. Um, I probably got it years and years ago at a Hardy Plant Society sale, but I know that they have it occasionally at Zira Plants if you're looking for it. And also, if you belong to the North American Rock Guard Society, their seed exchange had seed of Lathyrus furnace in it um, this year. And so here it is. And so here's the Lathyrus, here's Benediction. This is some Epimedium pinnatum var colchicum, one of the taller um, yellow Epimediums that makes a fine cut flower. And so I've made a little nosegay with one big camellia blossom in the middle. This is black magic. And then I've also used a little collar of geranium macrorhizum, the uh, big root hardy geranium. That foliage is scented and it makes a nice um, flowery, spicy, scented element to the nosegay uh, when the rest of these things aren't particularly scented. So of course, once I saw that it was in bloom, okay, I took pictures. Then I had to make an arrangement with you just to show you how absolutely charming the spring vetchling is and you should all be growing it. Uh, tulips, I adore tulips. If I had all the space in the world, I would probably breed tulips. Um, I just think they're absolutely fascinating. And I just want to mention quickly the varieties of tulips that last the longest as a cut flower. So the parrots, and this happens to be my favorite of the parrot tulips, but the parrot tulips are very long lasting. Any tulip that takes a long time to develop its color. Um, I once did a talk about cut flowers and was talking about tulips up at the Northwest Flower and Garden show in Seattle. And I had a Dutch woman come up to me afterwards and thank me for telling everybody that they should be buying their tulips when they're green. You want to see just enough color that you know what color the tulip is going to be, but no more. If you're buying tulips that are already brightly colored, then you've missed the whole show. You've missed that developing of the color in your vase. Then they, they stand up and they point towards the light and then they start to get too heavy for themselves and they start to lean around. And there are a million wives tales that tell you put pennies in the water and they won't do that. Or stick a pin underneath, just pierce the stem right underneath the flower with a pin and that will help them stand up straighter. And, um, it, and it's just absolutely hogwash, all of it. Tulips are going to do what they're going to do. And they're, they're growing. And they're one of the few cut flowers that actually continues to grow. And it's part of that is because of the cellular structure of their stem. They don't have a traditional xylem and phloem um, configuration to their vascular system. And so they tend to pass water from cell to cell indiscriminately up and down the stem and, and they continue to grow. And if you don't believe me, go buy a bunch of fairly green tulips, uh, you know, recut them before you put them in water, take off about an inch and they'll grow during the lifespan of them as a cut flower. Each stem will grow about two inches. And if you don't believe me, try it for yourself. So any of the tulips like Greenland that, or there's one called Spring Artist that have a flash of green that stays on the petal, um, those are gonna last longer, the parrots last longer. What they call French tulips that are super tall tulips, um, there's nothing French about them. They tend to be the late single uh, tulips and they get much taller then the other tulips do, some of them will be 36 inches tall. They're very long lasting. So the later in the season a tulip comes into its own, the better a longer lasting cut flower it will be. Um, I love this plant, not just because I love the smell of lily of the valley, 
but because later in the year, I can go out and pick a few of these um, uh, leaves and they make a great collar for a little nosegay. They're very bright. And I've had people um, come to my house for open gardens and they'll say, what hosta is this with these really strong stripes? And I go out and it's coming up amongst the bricks in our pathways because you know it's Lily the Valley, it's doing what it does. And, and I'm like, oh, you don't see a lot of hostas that are uh, invading pathways. But anyway, um, this is great, not just because it's a lily of the valley and it's sweet and evocative and smells good in the spring, but you can go out and raid that foliage uh, for a small arrangements later in the season throughout the summer. Uh, pinks are wonderful. And this is my favorite pink. Uh, the Rose du Mai, a very, very old cultivar. And this is a beautiful spread of it out at uh, Joy Creek Nursery. And again, these are only about a foot tall, more or less, but not every arrangement has to be huge. And the scent of these is just fantastic. It's really much stronger than the scent of most florist uh, carnations these days. Alliums, there's just a jillion good alliums. Um, they're all good cut flowers. The only thing I would caution you about alliums is that you really do, even if you're using floral preservative, need to change the water every two or three days, or you're gonna smell like the grill at Nick's Coney Islands, you know, where they grill the onions. For the hamburgers, um, yeah, you really uh, don't wanna let that water get old at all, even if you're using preservative. Um, I was really amazed to be taking this picture. I took it at Jane Austen's garden in the village of Chawton in England. And uh, so now we're moving into spring, into summer, or the season I like to call spummer. And you all know what I'm talking about. You're really waiting for summer and it keeps raining and it's really a spummer. So uh, I was surprised to see Budleia globosa in her garden and went and did the research and sure enough it's been in cultivation uh, she was gardening in the early 1800s uh, and this has been in cultivation since the mid 1700s uh, but what a great dr seuss plant i have had this plant for a long time and it gets kind of big and sprawly but it doesn't tend to go to seed and show up everywhere the way the budleia david i uh, species and hybrids of it can do, uh, but it's a great Dr. Seuss plant and a lot of fun for uh, early summer arrangements. My favorite herbaceous perennial cut flower is Scabiosa caucasica fama blue. And what I'm going to show you now is a few relatives of it. And I just want to say, if you don't let it set seed, and if you pick it in about this stage when, so you've got these beautiful ray flowers, but then this sort of tucked part in the middle um, is still, still tight. Um, that's when you wanna pick it and it will last about 10 days. And if you don't let it go to seed, it will keep flowering all summer. So why would you let it go to seed? If you wanna save seed of it, wait till the end of the season uh, but this cultivar is a fixed cultivar. It comes very well from seed. And once you have it, you might have to pay a little bit more to get plants of it or get your initial bunch of seed. Uh, but it's just an excellent, fluffy, slightly fragrant uh, cut flower. And what a great periwinkle blue that is. This plant used to be a scabiosa, and in fact, its common name is giant scabious, but this is now Cephalaria gigantea. And the picture you see there is of it at about seven or eight feet tall in the garden at Modest Font Abbey, where they grow a lot of herbaceous perennials. Yes, this is an herbaceous perennial, and you will only see a little bit of it by January in your garden, just a few little maybe sort of bits coming up from the crown, um, trying to figure out if it's time to come up yet. And then it comes up eight feet tall, but it has this scabiosa-like bloom in a very soft, very pretty buttercream yellow. So really great um, spring into summer plant. And again, if you don't let it set seed, 
you can keep um, harvesting it. And another great plant, um, Astrancha major. I have found that the colored varieties like Roma really want to be in more sun, but the original species actually flowers better in partial shade. The flowers are very papery. And if you don't let it set seed, it will keep flowering and flowering and flowering all summer long. Both Roma and Astrancha major will get maybe about two feet tall, maybe a little bit more. Um, the flowers rise above the mound of foliage underneath and um, just beautiful in the garden. I have not used it as a dried flower, but I know people who have and it dries beautifully. You know, just bundle it up and uh, hang it in a warm, dark place so that if you have one of the colored varieties like Roma, it won't fade. And uh, it's a great um, dried flower too, but don't let it set seed and it will flower all summer. So Sherry sort of alluded to this before, but I don't do talks anymore where I don't talk about clematis. And they are starting to become more and more available uh, in the cut flower trade. And I wish I, this is um, Niobe. No, this is Rutel here. This is called Pinky. This is Candida here, um, Daniel Deronda over here. Um, these are common varieties that you can find to grow in your garden. But when you grow them in Florida in a greenhouse, the flowers are much smaller than what you would pick from your own garden. And in Japan, they use the integrifolia forms, the herbaceous perennial clematis that don't climb. They use these in their tea ceremony. And in a tea ceremony, it's supposed to be calming and relaxing. And you're not supposed to talk about business. You're not supposed to talk about politics and always on every table, if you're having a tea ceremony or if you're in a tea room, there will be niches in the wall with little vases, bud vases with one perfect flower. And in Japan where they revere the clematis, it's quite often the clematis integrifolia forms like this skylark because they have a very simple little bell. And in fact, skylark was actually an introduction from the Rogers and clematis garden. Um, Brewster let me name this one uh, Skylark because of the color and the way it spreads out like bird's wings. And we gave this, uh, shared this with a clematis breeder named Mikiyoshi Chikama in Japan. And he said, well, you know, can I propagate it? And I said, well, of course, sure. And actually he had seen it here and then I was able to take it with me and give him a plant when the International Clematis Society went to Japan. Didn't hear too much more about it. And then about three years ago, we were contacted by a nonprofit organization who does a big plant sale every year. And evidently Skylark is extremely popular in Japan as a tea ceremony flower. And so if you, can't talk about business or politics, you talk about the flower and the characteristics of the flower, how the flower makes you feel, and you relax and drink your tea and talk about flowers. And so we were thrilled to find out that Skylark was a big hit in Japan. And this garden actually donated money to our garden um, because Mr. Chikama was breeding this and dividing it and giving it to them to sell for their fundraisers. And they felt like they should give something back to us, which is very Japanese uh, sort of uh, thing to do, very courteous people. And so um, we were delighted. So um, we actually propagate this through division because it goes a lot faster than cuttings or um, I'm not sure it would, I, we've never tried to grow it from seed. We don't know if it come, would come true from seed. And we don't have too much room here for a lot of experimenting like that. So we just divide it, lift it up and pull the crowns apart. And if you go to Garden Time on YouTube, um, I just did a, a 
couple of minutes with them on dividing clematis. And I think it was actually Skylark we were dividing. Anyway, it's an excellent cut flower. And like hellebores, which are in the same family, the ranunculaceae, these are close cousins. These guys last longer with a little alcohol in the water. Now we're into the height of summer. And what's more summery than a flock of Lysimachia clethroides? This is known as geese go walking. And any clump of uh, geese go walking, uh, all of the flowers will be pointed in the same direction towards the light. And they are, as you can sort of tell from the picture, they make a big patch. They'll kind of run a little bit if they have room to run. But if you keep harvesting them and don't let them go to seed, they will keep flowering through July and August. It's a really wonderful summer cut flower. And the sanguisorbas, the burnets, are wonderful cut flowers. So this is quite a large flower. These are probably two to three inches long, lavender squirrels. But a lot of the sanguisorbas, uh, just the typical sanguisorba officinale, the salad burnet. Um, there's a very tall, uh, variegated form called Dali marble that we grow out at the uh, Clackamas Community College herbaceous perennial gardens that has a much smaller flower that's more like a little club that is burgundy on these tall wiry stems. They're just fantastic. And as a cut flower, really charming, really interesting texture. And if you keep picking them and don't let them go to seed, I'm saying the same thing over and over, I know, but it's great that you can keep them going in your garden and you can keep them uh, and feel like you can cut a few stems off and enjoy them in a vase in the house and the sh you haven't ruined the show, the show will go on. When I was a florist, um, these were called cobra lilies and this is the part of the plant that we saw as a cut flower. This is the leaf, this is the pitcher of a pitcher plant. This one is Tarnock. This is actually the common cultivar that's used for the cut flower trade, uh, but this is not a flower. It's a leaf, it's called a phyllode. And this is what the flower actually looks like. And um, they usually don't cut the flowers, but the cut flowers, this will be as tall as the phyllodes are. So this can be 15 to 18 inches tall. Um, these bracts, well, so this is these are the sepals. The uh, pollen is inside another structure in here. And then these are the true petals hanging down. Those won't last that long, but the inner portions and the outer um, sepals will last quite a long time um, in a vase. And uh, I always think it's kind of diabolical that these plants are attracting these pollinators with these fabulous flowers. And then the pollinator, pollinators get stuck down the phyllodes. And um, here's a hornet trying to, to uh, break out, but uh, he didn't make it. Uh, but anyway, this is the part that's often used in cut flowers uh, and they're very long lasting. So let's take a look at some of this uh, craziness for the summer. This is actually Scabiosa fama white. And this arrangement was a good two feet taller than me once I had it all constructed. Um, this is flowering, the flowering um, oak leaf hydrangea. You can see the green foliage there. And here's our cephalaria, our giant scabious. And here are the bright green uh, cobra lilies of Saracenia flava. And what else is fun? There's some, I, there is some store-bought stuff in here. I think I ended up buying the, um, the fama white because I hadn't seen it before. And also this is just a white um, foxtail lily, the Aramaris. But uh, they sell Aramaris down at uh, Dancing Oaks and they grow it quite successfully down there in their display garden. This is just um, the, the bronze fennel flowers. And then these wonderful screwy things here coming off to the sides, that, those are the flower stems of Verbascum bombiciferum polar summer, which is a wonderful 
forms a big silver, uh, heavily felted rosette of big, big leaves. And the great thing about this, it's a plant from the steps. It takes up a lot of room in the garden, but no weeds come up underneath it. Uh, it's just really wonderful for covering and shading the ground and making a big statement. They're sort of biennial, short-lived perennials, but you can grow them from seed. They'll flower the second year, but by the end of the first year, they're starting to work on this big, big, like 36 inches across rosette of really fabulous foliage. And then they put up these stems and the stem, the bud, um, all of it is really, really white, white and fuzzy. And then the flowers are brilliant, brilliant yellow. And you can see just a few uh, flowers dotting those. But anyway, um, it's great cut flower, lots and lots of fun. Um, another very tall, but my favorite black-eyed Susan is actually the green-eyed black-eyed Susan. This is Rudbeckia herbstsona. This will get six to seven feet tall in the garden, but it has a beautiful branching structure. So you can go in and take branches off that are two or three feet long and still have a tremendous um, display because it branches really well and flowers um, July and clear into early September, right through the heat of the summer. Solidago, of course. Um, in the aster family and it's been crossed with some of the asters to make a cut uh, filler called solid uh, solid aster but this is just your basic spike um, solidago from the midwest really wonderful cut flower my favorite of the lavenders as cut flowers are the pedunculata forms you can get them in different colors now um, sometimes they call these French lavender or Spanish lavender, uh, but they've got those um, peduncles, I guess they are, those structures at the end of the inflorescence, um, the sort of feathers that give them a little bit more distinction and a little bit more presence uh, in a vase. Not quite as scented as the old English lavenders, but if you want something that's got a nice herbal scent to it and it's got more firepower as far as the flower impact goes, um, I would grow the Labendula pedunculata. So what I've learned lately about why I was failing with agapanthus was because I was trying to grow the evergreen forms and they are not nearly as hardy for us as the forms that die back pretty completely in the winter. Um, Agapanthus Joyful Blue is a selection that they made out at Joy Creek Nursery with bright blue flowers. And then at the um, Clackamas Community College, we grow the dark flowered form, the Inapertus, which is much more tubular, and then Atropurpurea. When you see the prefix atro in front of any of the Latin color words, it means darker than. So Atro sanguinea would be dark red and atro purpurea would be very dark purple. Um, but these are fantastic cut flowers. And I think it's pretty amazing also. Um, I've noticed now that I'm successful with these in my garden because I know which ones to grow, the hummingbirds love these. And what that tells me is that they're more, they're as drawn to the shape of something as they are drawn to the color red. So here out at the Clackamas Garden, you've got these, um, that's Penstemon arabesque red back there. Um, they're coming to that, but they're also coming to this in, in equal measure. Um, I think they're figuring if it's tubular, there's probably something good at the end of that tube that my uh, beak can reach. So they're great cut flowers. And I would just say about agapanthus, if you're going to cut some, you want to cut it when only about half the florets are open. And that way you'll get to enjoy the rest of them uh, as they open. So I, I love a roadside stand 
and we got to actually visit the garden that was producing uh, the bounty here of this roadside stand. So I was on a Hardy Plant Society garden tour of Bainbridge Island. And so this was early August and look at all the gorgeous cut flowers, lots and lots of herbaceous perennials in there uh, generating their bouquets. So this was the Bainbridge Island Floral Company. And um, one of the grasses that they grow, but this picture was taken at Clackamas Community College is uh, Miscanthus Gold Bar. And I didn't put the patent number up there, but it is a patented plant. It was the first plant that Joy Creek Nursery patented. It is a wonderful, upright, about five feet tall, non-floppy, doesn't bloom very much and it blooms very late in the season, but look at all those gold bars. There was never a better named plant. It just is wonderful upright, sturdy. I do not like floppy ornamental grasses. And uh, I also don't like ornamental grasses that seed all over the place. And this one flowers very little. It puts all of its energy into those fabulous uh, blades of grass and um, holds its color really, really late in the season before it goes completely tan. Um, I only do weddings for relatives. So my husband's younger brother was getting remarried uh, a couple of years ago. And I said, we would certainly do the flowers. And his bride, even though it was August, wanted a really autumnal color palette. And this is a plant that if you're not growing in your cut flower garden or in your garden to take stems off of it, this is Hypericum, St. John's wort. This is one that gets three to four feet tall with these fabulous orange berries. This one is Elstad, and that's in your list. Um, couple of different styles of traditional sunflowers and then some redder ones. And then this again is foliage or the flowers from bronze fennel used as the filler. And then I did have to buy the roses because I don't grow cutting quality roses in my garden, that's for sure. Um, but anyway, very fun um, and really textural sort of uh, summer bouquet for my sister-in-law, Liz. Hellenium is a fantastic cut flower. There's a wonderful old yellow form called Butterpat. They have brought out one from Joy Creek Nursery that is a bright gold called Tijuana Brass. Really great. And this one is actually a selection that we made here at the Rogers and Clematis Garden. One year, my students um, in the herbaceous perennial class at Clackamas Community College grew a seed strain of Hellenium called Red Gold, which had red flowers, all of them heavily, heavily tipped with gold. And we had a bunch left over and I asked if it was okay. And they said, yeah. So I brought about five different plants not in bloom yet to the Clematis Garden. And we had this one, it was solid red and we loved it for years. And I finally took some stems to Paul Bonine at Zira Plants and said, what do you think of this? And he said, oh my God, can we sell that for you? Because he knew that we don't wanna sell anything that isn't Clematis. We don't wanna muddy our mission but we did get to um, we did get to name it summer cinnabar, and they sell this uh, in the summertime at zero plants, and then we get a dollar per plant. So a little fundraiser, but also an absolutely fabulous pollinator attractor, and these make a nice column. They get uh, four to five feet tall and rather columnar. Um, once in a while, they'll flatten if we get a really heavy rain in August, which we don't usually do, uh, but really, really great long lasting cut flower. I like dahlias that don't look like dahlias. And that's really all I have to say about dahlias. This is one of my favorites. This is Blue Bayou. Uh, there are lots of what they call the anemone flowered uh, dahlias. And all you need to know about dahlias is cut flowers. You will learn 
on the Swan Island Dahlia webpage. They've got a great page on using them as uh, cut flowers. And when I wrote Garden to Vase, basically with their permission, I just copied all of that information into the book. Um, but basically, dahlias don't drink much after they have been cut. So you dip them in hot water, 160 degrees. You've got some floral preservative and they go, you cut them, they go into the water and they go, ah, and they drink up a bunch of water. And then that's it pretty much for the rest of their life in a vase. And if you don't do that hot water treatment with preservative dissolved in the water, they're gonna last three or four days and they can last up to two weeks if you do that pre-treatment um, after they're cut. So anyway, Blue Bayou, if you like dahlias that don't look like dahlias. I'm wild about the beauty berries. I don't think I've met one I don't like. And this is a really interesting one, both as a cut berry and in the garden, because this is a beauty berry that spreads. This will get maybe four to five feet tall, but it will spread six to seven feet. It's much broader than it is tall. And you get these long wands with these beautiful berries. The typical beauty berry we see is a cultivar called profusion, tends to be very upright growing. Um, this one has a lot more grace to the form of it and the berries are smaller, but you can see how many there are going to be. And it develops before the other carpas do, hence the name early amethyst. It's really wonderful um, as a cut element. And lilies, I could go on and on about lilies. I often feel sorry for my herbaceous perennial students because they have to listen to it all. But um, this is my favorite lily for cutting. And I call it my Labor Day lily because that's when it starts to bloom. It's very late season, uh, native to Japan and named after the person who um, selected it, Mr. Uchida, was given an award of garden merit in the uh, by the Royal Horticulture Society in, I think, 1850 or 1958 um, after the war. But what's interesting about it, and it's hard to tell from this picture, is that all of these peduncles, all of these leaf stems are about 10 inches long, which means that for a nosegay, that's a nice long stem to make. And you get this big impact. They're slightly fragrant. Um, so this this starting at that stem there out to the end of the flower is probably 15 to 18 inches long. And then this peduncle is about 10 inches long. So you can actually get some pretty good length. And then this, this branch up here that we can't see the origin of it is growing off of the same stem. So you can actually go out and, and sort of take some flowers out of the flower head and not really diminish the show in the garden. Lilies are really easy to propagate. Um, you can pit, pull off a few scales from each of the bulbs when you buy them. And usually within two years, that scale will produce more bulbs and you'll have blooming bulbs. So I never mind paying too much for a lily bulb because I know I can make more. Another really fun, this is the uh, grass. This is the black fountain grass. And it's only two to three feet tall, so it's not a big, huge grass, but it's one of the penicetums. And this one is called Modri and really, really dark seed heads, really dramatic. Uh, for those of you who, who like dark drama in the garden, this is a great ornamental grass. It flowers very late in the season. Um, Always, if I was talking about it when I used to teach herbaceous perennials in the summer and class was over by the middle of August and usually nobody's, nobody had Modri in bloom yet. So I actually quit trying to teach about it because nobody was gonna get to see it except in pictures. Uh, but this picture would have been taken in early October uh, on Long Island in New York at a botanic garden there and I was, they had kind of a sporadic hedge of different heights of ornamental grasses. 
And this one really stood out because of the really fluffy texture, long seed head and really super dark seeds. And so we're really in the fall now. And I wanna remind everybody that the fall foliage color on our border peonies, on our just herbaceous perennial peonies can be spectacular. And I also learned from a peony grower that once they start to turn color like this, that foliage is no longer building up the roots anymore. And you can start, as soon as it gets a really good color on it, you can start cleaning it up in the garden and you can start using it in fall um, flower arrangements. And it's very long lasting. Um, my students in the cutting garden classes have to do science projects where they um, pick something and experiment to see if it's a good cut flower or foliage. And quite often when they do an experiment, if they choose peony foliage, they get bored and they end up ending the experiment after two or three weeks because the foliage still looks good. And so they stop changing the water and it still looks good. And they actually kind of start getting into cut flower torture, which I do not advocate, but just telling you what a great cut foliage, peony foliage is, and we don't even think about it. Um, so this picture was taken um, for an in-service uh, event at Clackamas Community College. So we had the big stage there and a little something in front of the podium and then the bigger arrangement. All of those flowers, uh, with the exception of the verbascum, which I was able to bring in, but everything else, including this rattlesnake snake master um, oryngium uh, sea holly, that's the yuccafolium, oryngium yuccafolium. All of these, they just let me go out to the herbaceous perennial can yard where they had plants that either they were gonna sell the next year or that hadn't sold in any of the plant sales over the summer. And I just got to go hog wild picking things. Um, so there's some autumn beauty sedums, gorgeous echinacea. This is a purple phlox called um, Nikki, which uh, because of the timing of when they were growing the plants was just coming into bloom for the first time. And then some ornamental grasses. We have a lot of miscanthus forms that we grow out at the community college. So that was really fun to put together uh, a really bright. And we knew that there was gonna be this bright blue, uh, Clackamas College blue uh, drape behind it. So we needed to do something that would really, really show up. And this container is really fun. It's a giant, giant old soup kettle. That's about 24 inches around. And then this uh, last fall, um, the Hardy Plant Society of Oregon asked me to do a fall arrangement for their first Zoominar uh, that they did last fall. And so this was behind the speaker as the speaker was talking. Um, so that was kind of fun to have that there. This has got some um, purple grape, the Vitus vinifera purpurea, not really an edible grape. It's very, very seedy. Um, this is Sedum Confusum, which I love just for the name. Uh, some, some very late season uh, leaves of nasturtium Alaska mix. Oops, back. This is actually um, the evergreen clematis that I showed you before. This is a nice new growth on uh, clematis fascic fasciculiflora. Some, some yellow hosta leaves. I don't even remember what hosta that was. And then the fall color on the oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea quercifolia. Wonderful, wonderful uh, multi-season interest in the garden plant, great for cutting both the flowers, which are white, and then they fade to green, and then they get kind of a tannish pink. And then um, the foliage, of course, gets great fall color. And whatever is left in my garden when I start cleaning up, and I love this little marigold. Uh, some people get to be plant snobs and marigold. They're too good for marigolds. But this is so sharp with those um, perfectly drawn, perfectly straight burgundy and, and golden yellow uh, stripes. Who could not love that? 
with some cotinus, an old hydrangea that was probably blue that had turned uh, pink, and then two kinds of rose hips here. The little ones are from a uh, rose called lighter rose that uh, flowers all summer, and then um, my Rosa mutabilis uh, has wonderful hips on it, a little more purple grape, and uh, some more of that Laura Petalum. I was telling you about Laura Petalum Razzleberry. A little close up there of the cutest, cutest marigold in the whole world. Um, I would not be without this plant and I've already got seeds starting for this year. And there we have it. Um, I wanna thank you all um, for letting me sort of walk down memory lane and also think about if I was ever gonna get a chance to reissue uh, Garden to Vase, all the wonderful things that exist now that didn't exist in 2007, like Gold Bar, uh, Miss Canthus, that I would certainly mention along with new favorites like the Lathyrus in the spring or the Garia elliptica, which I don't know why I didn't include in the first place for the winter. So I hope you're looking at your gardens differently now. And I hope that when you're recommending plants to people, because that's one of the things that master gardeners get asked to do a lot, I hope you'll start thinking about mentioning that something might be a really good cut flower. And I think more people would grow more cut flowers if they had more confidence, if they knew what to use. And also they need to broaden their plant palette of, um, of what they think of as a cut flower or a cut foliage. Sherry, are we ready for questions? Linda, what a fabulous presentation. Thank Such you. Such a treat of all the beautiful photos and arrangement and the plants, just in time for us to go hit the nurseries. Yeah, <laughs> if they so, have anything left. Yeah, yeah, it, that's a problem, isn't it? Everybody is gardening and looking for plants. So we have uh, three questions and I think we're just gonna take these three and no more okay. because it's uh, yeah. running a little late. Um, you mentioned that daffodils should be put in water to get rid of the sap. Yeah. So once they have gone through that treatment, can, can one use them in mix arrangement? Yes. Does that yes. work? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of the old flower arranging books say that like you can't put daffodils with tulips because it will kill the tulips. And that's true if you haven't rinsed that sap away. Hmm. But once that sap has sort of bled out of the stem, the stem isn't going to produce any more sap. So it's gonna keep drinking water, but there won't be anything coming back down. And so then once you've done all that rinsing, you can use them with anything. So you've mentioned using Laura Petalum a couple of times. Yeah. So how do you treat the Laura Petalum branches that you cut before using them in a vase? Okay, so that's another thing that you'll, you'll read in older floral arranging books that you hammer the stems of woody plants, mm. but that creates a lot of debris in the water. So all that debris, you're gonna have microorganisms feeding on that debris. All this stuff can clog the vascular system of the stem. And you don't wanna do that. You want the, the most important thing for flower longevity is clean water. And even if you don't use preservative, for goodness sake, keep the water clean. And so change it every few days. So what we do with woody plants is one of two things now. Um, I talked about cutting it at an angle. So you are exposing more cambium and mm -hmm. then you make a vertical cut up the stem. It's in the book, it's very well illustrated <laughs> uh, because I'm not trying to take pictures of myself. But anyway, you do a vertical cut up the stem. And so then it can, you haven't created any debris in the water, but you've exposed a lot more cambium. The other thing you can do is do your angled cut. And then for about an inch above the cut, take like a straight bladed grafting knife or a good sharp paring knife and just scrape off the bark. Again, you're exposing the cambium, but those little pieces of bark go on the kitchen floor. 
not in your face. And so you've got this sort of nice, sharp end, but you're not whittling. You don't want to whittle away the cambium. You just want to expose it. So for something like lilacs, that works really well. And lilacs are great because they have bright yellow cambium. You can really see uh, where you where to stop whittling. Uh, and anyway, so that's what we do. No more hammering the stems because that just makes a mess. Got it. No hammering. So uh, quite a few times you said, don't let the flowers go to seed. Yeah. Do you mean we need to cut the flowers earlier than we normally would? How, how do we look at a flower and know? Right. So you've got an herbaceous perennial like a scabiosa. And I showed you the big ray, ray petals were open and then the, um, the middle of it where the flowers are smaller um, and they sort of puff out a little bit. Um, but once those petals collapse and you'll start to have um, the, seed, the seeds forming, mm -hmm. then the plant thinks it's done its job I've, I've propagated myself, I've created seed. So if they don't get to set seed, then the crown keeps producing more flowers. Mm -hmm. so, so if you're going to keep it from going to seed so that you have more flowers, you might as well pick those flowers, some of them at <laughs> least, in time to come in the house and be in a vase for a while. Okay, that's clear now. So someone you and I both know, Elizabeth Howley, yes, says, Linda, you have knocked my socks off once again. <laughs> and I'm going to sneak in one little question. You okay. I said just do three more. Okay. Um, you mentioned the lilies, that yeah. the bulbs are, and you used the term peeling the bulbs. Yes. Okay. So a true lily bulb has, it, it looks a bit like an artichoke. It's got scales of starch, uh, basically carbohydrate, um, that the bulb will feed off of if it gets into a stressed situation. So they overlap each other and they're all attached to the bottom basal plate of the bulb. Mm -hmm. And whenever you buy a new bulb, you can take a few of those scales, they call them scales, you can take a few of those scales off it won't hurt your bulb any. Put them in a Ziploc bag with some slightly moist coconut fiber and put them in a dark room temperature place like cabinet over the refrigerator, which is what I use at home. Um, stick them up there and make a note on your phone to ping you in four weeks. And you go look and at the base of the scale where you broke it off of the basal plate, there will be little bulbs forming. And that takes four to six weeks. And then you can take those little bulbs off and plant them into a four inch pot. And in two years, you will have a flowering size bulb. <laughs> and it's the easiest thing in the world. So you can, you can go out and buy your 10 or $12 lily bulb. And, and some people would just say, oh my God, I would never pay that much for a bulb. <laughs> well, you can make a jillion more. So why wouldn't you? Because you end up virtually paying yourself um, in more bulbs. So it's, it's really wonderful. It's a technique that I teach at Clackamas Community College in the herbaceous perennials class. And it's just a miracle. You know, we're going to do this in two weeks. And, and then by the end of the term, the students will have little baby bulbs with little roots. I mean, it's adorable. <laughs> it's like a litter of puppies. It's just that cute. Well, Linda, we're just going to have to have you come back and tell us all kinds of other wonderful secrets. <laughs> so here are some comments. Terrific. Thank you, Linda. Wonderful workshop. People are really enjoying it. So thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. We learned so much. And again, recording of tonight's uh, presentation is going to be available in a couple of days and look for the follow-up email you receive. It will have a link to the recording. It will uh, repeat the links to the handouts. So thank you again, Linda. You're welcome. And uh, we'll see you at the Clematis Garden. Yes, it's opened until dusk. Yeah, happy 50th anniversary of thank the you. Rogerson thank Collection. You. Thank you.
Bye, everybody.